All right, thank you so much, Robin, for the kind introduction. And I'm just directly going to jump into the talk real quick. So before uh, giving you a background of the known services and how we are using it at ESNet, I just wanted to give an overview of our architecture because then the following slides would make more sense. So um, this is a very dumb and stupid diagram of like cartoonish diagram of one of our data centers where we are putting the taps. So as you can see, we are not doing super fancy stuff. We are just having um, two 10 gig uplinks. And the, the way we are tapping that, uh, those two links are between our um, code router and the distribution switch, which means that we are actually seeing the east-west traffic. And east-west traffic is a key for this presentation. So keep in mind that this, that's the traffic we are monitoring with Zeek. Apart from the east-west traffic, we also see, of course, north-south traffic because oh, whoever is, uh, or whatever systems and servers we have behind the distribution switch, they would also be able to reach out to the internet and come back. So east-west plus north-south traffic. So that's the gist of this diagram. And um, yeah, two 10 gig link, links, pretty standard. Taps going into the Arista, which is our network, network load balancing solution. It is doing the symmetric hashing and routing to our um, Zeek nodes. And that's where our traffic is getting distributed to multiple workers. And then this, that's where we are running Zeek. So all the logs that are, uh, that are getting uh, generate, generated by Zeek are actually seeing the east-west as well as north-south traffic of our data center. All right, so what are known services in Zeek? So if you guys have been running Zeek for quite a long period of time or even just started with Zeek, you would know that there is a log file um, called knownservices.zeek, uh, knownservices.log that Zeek generates. So the logic behind that, uh, the logic behind that um, log file is actually wh whatever Zeek sees. Uh, so these are the three important things that Zeek is trying to uh, detect the known services for. So the first one is the TCP handshake. So if it has observed a TCP handshake on one of your server IPs, and it has, uh, it has seen, this, it has seen the, uh, the uh, handshake established, it will record that as the server IP and server port that is having an active service on that port. The second one is the, uh, it is assuming. So if it has not seen the um, handshake, but it has seen the midstream traffic, then it will also log that as the so it, it will also log, log that as the server IP and server port that is actively being used on the network. And the third one is for the UDP that if there is a UDP packet sent from the server IP from that port to whatever client uh, it is talking to, then that will be actually considered as an active IP and the port. So that is kind of like the, uh, that is kind of like the analysis engine uh, behind the known services.log file. And then uh, if the protocol name is found, then of course it is, it is logged into the known services uh, log file. But if it, it if it, if it is not found, then the directly the, um, the port number is logged without any service. So where can you find the known services? So as I mentioned that if you are a user of Zeek, you would already know that there is a known services.log file that Zeek generates. And there is a policy uh, script that resides in the policy protocols con folder, which is called known services.c, and that has that logic of uh, determining whether the, whether the service is active and which, which port is being used by the service. So as you can see on the screen, that is the uh, snippet of the uh, known services known services.log file. So it has uh, five columns. The first one is of course the timestamp. The second one is the host IP or the server IP it has seen on your network. The third one is the port on which it has seen the communication happening. The fourth one is the uh, transport protocol. And then the last column uh, is the service that actually is uh, known to seek. So that is pretty standard uh, known services.log file if you have been looking into your logs, uh, you would see that pretty often. So uh, what, where, and how? So how Zeek uh, is detecting that? So I, th that, that script is like three, 300, li 300 lines long. So I don't want to uh, focus your attention to the logic behind the script, but actually just one simple thing that uh, would be useful for east-west traffic detection, uh, which I'm going to cover in the next few slides. So if you see that there is a condition where actually Zeek is matching the, the destination IP of your connection to the local host that you have defined. So if you have configured Zeek in production, you would know that there is, there is a networks.cfg file that Zeek relies on to, uh, to collect your uh, local site, local site, local addresses. So in that script, that's what it is using that uh, if you see the second snippet where the function is called the known service is done, that's where, it is, that, that's where it is checking that if the response host of that connection is your local host, then log it or process it uh, subsequently, or if not, then just skip out of the function. So it is actually checking the local host 
pretty straightforward checking your local host if you have defined it in your network, networks.cfg file. So now coming to the problems. So as I have been mentioning repeatedly that for east-west traffic, how would you assess your attack surface? So for example, if somebody comes, comes up to you and says that, hey, do you know how many servers you have open to the internet that runs SSH, or how many servers you have open to the internet that runs web or DNS, whatnot. So it, it becomes a little tricky, because if you are running uh, east-west traffic through Zeek, then that file is solely depending on the uh, or depending on your servers that are in the local host. It doesn't know whether that server has responded to a connection internal or it has responded to a connection external. So how would you know whether that server IP is open to the internet or it's just open to your local network? It happens a lot because our uh, data center is pretty restrictive. So we know that some of the services that we are seeing in the in the unknown services.log file should not be open to the internet. For example, SSH and some other. Uh, restrictive services. So here I am so I'm showing you just an example that the first con log, uh, this is pretty production traffic. So you can see the first IP and the second IP, like the source IP and the response IP. They both belong to our network and they both belong to different VLANs. And of course, that traffic is captured by Zeek. It is logging into the connection.log file. And then it is actually reporting it in the known services.log file as well that it has seen that server IP uh, responding on port 22. We know, I mean, I can look at the IP and I can know that this IP should not be open to the internet, but there is no way right now to um, call it out in the known services.log file that whether that IP is open to the internet or open to the local network. So that's the challenge for the east-west traffic monitoring and the current known services uh, block file that gets generated for that traffic. So solutions, so it is pretty straightforward and uh, we just came up with a solution that why don't we just check the source IP and see if the source IP that uh, that was actually connecting to the server, if that is local, then hey, it's an internal connection. But if the source IP is internet, that is that means if it is not in our site local network, then that is an external connection. So it's pretty dumb, straightforward solution that we came up with. So you can see in the snippet, there is the, 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 th the third one in which we are actually um, verifying the flag. So we are adding another field uh, in the known services.log file that is uh, actually recording whether the source IP is local or the source IP is internet. So it's pretty straightforward. It is just uh, after the loop, uh, after the function, it, it, after the function when it checks that uh, your uh, host is local, the response host is local, it is actually checking the source IP as well. That if the source IP is in your local net, then uh, create a field, uh, local origin, and then assign it a true. And then if it's not, if your source is not local, then assign it as false. And then uh, the, the, the info record, you can see that the last field, we are just adding one more field to the info record just to know whether uh, that server was responding to a local IP or non-local IP. So that was pretty standard, straightforward solution that we came up with. Pretty dumb solution, actually. But it works. So uh, result, now if somebody comes up to us and says that, hey, do you know how many servers are open to the internet or do you know how many servers are open to the local? Now we can say, because now we have a flag in our known services.log file, uh, which say which is 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 origin local. So I this count is from our production uh, last seven days worth of data, and I can just say that for the 96% uh, of the time the service is recorded in that file is actually local, which is good because we don't have a lot of like a fingerprint or footprint on the internet, and only three percent of the traffic, which is like roughly 75 servers, had the local origin local origin. Uh, flag false, that means those are the servers that are actually open to the internet. So that gave us a pretty terse list, and now we can just go back and see what all servers were reported, and then what services are reported on those servers that are open to the internet. So that kind of like gave us a distribution, a decent distribution of uh, how many hosts are open to the internet and how many hosts are just open to the local network. Okay, so so far we have been discussing a lot about the inbound, right? That and it's pretty standard because if you guys are running a production network, you would kind of like constantly being asked by, by the networking people or by the security people that, hey, we should just block the inbound connection to the servers that are not required uh, to have access from the internet. So it, it works all, uh, all uh, good when you have the inbound policies for blocking because you can easily go back to your known services.log file and you can say that this is what my profile looks like and I don't need these 50 SSH servers to be open to the internet. So works really well. Uh, we have been doing it for a while. And even in my past job, we have been doing it for a long period of time to block inbound connections. But before even zero trust uh, discussion started, we were actually discussing on how we can uh, plan on blocking the outbound connections from the uh, from the from our network on the firewall because everyone allows the outbound. I mean, 
as far as I have talked to people, most of the people allow outbound connections. They don't have any restrictive policy because they don't want to tamper or interrupt people's working uh, capabilities in their network. So we started to uh, think about how we can actually even assess that how many services are out there on the internet uh, uh, that our servers and systems and, uh, and the clients on our network connect to. So it was kind of like completely opposite use case. So, um, so how, yeah, so figure out what services are required access and then just restrict the access to based on what services are required and then block everything else. The other use, useful part of it is if you are seeing random CNCs or if you have compromised systems that are just uh, going outbound and connecting to weird ports, if you have egress policy filtering, then the, those all connections will be blocked too. So that will also save you if you have already compromised system on your network. So solution, again, when we were thinking about that, I was like, oh, Zeek does that for inbound. So how about we just use Zeek for the outbound? So we started doing some um, known services outbound detection with Zeek. Again, pretty standard and very basic solution. And what we did was we just took our customized uh, known services uh, script that was actually recording the inbound connections and we just flipped the condition. So if you guys are paying attention in the previous slides, we ha I had the same uh, snippet where actually the local uh, host, uh, the local nets were actually getting tallied for the destination IP. So the server IPs that are recorded in the known services or log file, they were actually matched against the local host that you have defined in your networks.cfg file. If I flip that condition, like if I say that I do not want to log any uh, destination IP that is in my local, but I want to log any destination IP that has uh, that is on the internet and it has responded to uh, to the connection. So that's what the condition is, where I have actually literally just taken out the the uh, the not sign and then it's, and started processing the traffic for the internet servers. So um, so these are the four use cases we came up with and. Uh, the first two use cases will be logged into the known services.log file, the custom one with the flag, and then the rest two use cases will be logged into the known services outbound log file. Now, the interesting thing is that the first one, local to local, when the origin originating IP or your source IP is local and your destination IP is local, that's pretty standard. Like if you are running taps on the east west traffic, that's the most of the time you should see on, in your known services.log file. But if you are running that script in your north-south traffic, like if you have that script enabled and you are not dealing with any kind of east-west traffic, that condition should raise the flags for you because either you have something misconfigured in your, uh, in your network that you are just seeing source IP from your local network and destination IP from your local network, or somebody's spoofing your source IP. Like for example, it is actually a legit inbound connection, but source IP is spoofed in your local IPs. So not only the known services would record these conditions, but if you're paying attention and if you know where exactly your taps are, they can actually show you or tell you if there are any misconfigurations in your network or if, if actually somebody's spoofing the traffic. So the first one pretty standard. Uh, the first case should not happen, of course, for North South. If it is happening, then you should just take a look at why it is happening. The second one and the third one are like internet to local and local to internet. Th those are the two cases we are interested in because the second one actually tells us our attack surface uh, open to the internet, like the, our, our servers that are open to the internet. And then the third one is uh, showing us that what all internet services we are using. So those are two, two important ones logged into the known services.log and known services outbound.log that we are most interested in. And lastly, the fourth one, not to miss any other use case, the fourth one, internet to internet. Again, that should not happen. No matter where you are putting your scripts, even north, south, east, west, doesn't matter. But that should not happen because if it's if it is happening and if, if you're seeing that in your log file, then that means that either, again, you have network misconfiguration or somebody actually brought up a new network without telling you. Because if you are keeping an eye on your uh, networks.cfg and you're keeping updating, keep updating it, and then if as soon as somebody uh, brings up the new network, you should add those IPs to your local, uh, local, uh, local site, local IPs. So that fourth case is showing you that no IP in your source or destination is detected as local. And one of them should, should be your local IP because you are sniffing your local traffic. So that one, that one actually is a good indication that somebody just brought up a network and didn't tell you as a security engineer. So you need to update your networks.cfg file for those IPs to be detected as local. So pretty handy. Uh, these are the only four use cases possible. And again, two and three pretty standard if you're, if you're seeing one and four. Depending on one, depending on your egress traffic or depending on your east-west traffic, you should not see that on north-south. But the fourth one is pretty standard. You, sh you should not see the fourth one at all, no matter where your taps are. 
Okay, so the egress traffic, um, okay, I have to be quick. So th this is the statistics of the known services outbound log. So what I did was I took, we have been running these scripts in production for last three months. So this is the set of services that I, uh, I picked up from the known services outbound for the last seven days. It was to our amazement that we are only seeing 12 to 15 roughly services that our systems are reaching outbound. I was expecting more, but that is a pretty terse list to go through, right? So the count doesn't show that these are the unique servers we are connecting to. The count is like DNS service was detected 20, 15, uh, 157,000 times and logged that as a service in our log file. So uh, roughly 35,000-ish unique IP addresses uh, outbound we saw. But anyways, we have gone through the analysis of most of them, and I'm just going to share some of the interesting use cases we came across because I don't have much time. But this is the list, which is pretty interesting because you see most of them kind of like you would also expect on your traffic that SSL people should be reaching out on the web services for SSL or encrypted services. DNS is pretty standard, NTP, HTTP pretty standard. Depending on if you allow outbound SSH to different servers, it should also be pretty standard. Again, your mail servers should be reaching out, SMTP is standard. And there are a few other last services that I'm, I'm going to talk about, especially IRC. But in any case, uh, so this was the statistical summary for our production environment for last seven, uh, last seven days. So investigation one, the, so the, I started looking at the outbound HTTP connections and the first thing I saw was uh, there were a lot of Ubuntu server, most of our Ubuntu servers, they were reaching out to security.ubuntu.com for updates, like for the mirror packages and whatnot. So the thing is that we run our own local mirror. So why these, these servers are contacting out for the Ubuntu server updates. So the cause was that when I looked into, or when we looked into a couple of server configurations, they were using the default Debian repo. They were not getting the custom updates from uh, our engineers that they should actually point to the uh, linuxmirror.es.net. And why was that happening? Pretty easy, there was like a, uh, an Ansible uh, script error. Uh, there was like a misconfiguration in the Ansible script that was actually pushing out that update to our servers. And it was not even getting run at all on our servers. And that's why the servers were just taking the default Debian repo that was configured when they were brought up, and that's, how, that's why they were just using all those canonical, no, canonical names to reach out to Ubuntu server for updates. Pretty easy fix, we just raised a ticket and then we just asked them to fix the Ansible, Ansible script, and then, our, then, and then our infrastructure team uh, fixed the code and then pushed it out. So now they should all hopefully be pointing to linuxmirrors.es.net to uh, get the updates. So that was one pretty uh, easy use case. The second one was the IRC connection. So if you guys are paying attention, the, the list that I showed for the 15 services, the last one was IRC, and there was just one connection detected. Now, the funny thing is we don't even run IRC at all on our clients or on our, on our service and systems. So why there was an IRC connection outbound? So I was uh, looking at the traffic, and it looked like that there was one of our server IPs that was trying to connect outbound to a to an IP that is in Beijing uh, on port 6669, which is the standard default port for IRC. That is the uh, production uh, log that I am uh, showing on the screen, which is con.log. And then you can see that uh, the source IP is our IP, destination IP is the outbound uh, internet IP, and then the, the um, protocol or service that was recorded was IRC. So the cause was pretty standard. Like the, if, you, if you are, uh, if you're, if you're used to looking at the con.log file, there is a field called history that is recorded in the connection.log file. I have highlighted that on the screen, which is like H-A-D-A-T-T. So you can see that the first packet that Zeke saw was a synac. That means it was actually missing the first syn packet. So it was pretty reasonable for Zeke to assume that, okay, it was an outbound, outbound connection because I didn't see a syn. So that's why Zeke recorded it as an outbound, but it looked like that it is not actually an IRC connection because if you focus on the ports, it's, it looks like that the source port is 80. So it, highly likely the chances are it's an inbound connection and it's a web connection based on the ports. So yeah, again, like I, I asked the question that is it really IRC connection? So we are to rescue anytime I have any um, questions about the connections and if they don't look okay, I just go to the weird.log file. And again, there were like these all weird lines about this connection that Zeke was reporting that this is invalid message. Like the whole message is malform. The, the, the command is invalid. The, um, the, size is, uh, the size is not right. The command is too low. So I, re I realized that it is actually not an IRC connection. So um, 
it was actually in, in it was actually an inbound HTTP connection. We were able to find the pcap, and then we were we, we were looking it into the pcap. It's just like Zeke just missed the first send packet. That's why it reported it as an it reported it as an outbound IRC connection. So it was pretty legit inbound connection. And the poor guy uh, from China, he, he was just trying to get the CentOS 7 ISO image from our server. So that was the actual connection, proper handshake and everything. Okay, so resolution. So turns out that I was incapable of troubleshooting that connection by myself. So I reached out to, to Awesome Z community and then I was talking to uh, Justin and then actually he pointed out that, you know, there is a similar PR that weren't actually uh, pushed out a couple of months ago. And that exactly deals with this, with this issue that if, um, Zeke misses a SYN packet, but the connection is legit, that means like SYNAC and then there are data packets and then the proper reset, then actually it is flipped by Zeke saying that it is a legit connection, it is, no, uh, it is, not, a scan, uh, it is not a scan attempt, and I'm just going to flip the, flip the connection. So that change or that PR got merged into the master at that time, that means it was actually available in 5.1 and newer versions. So he asked me to test or rerun that PCAP with the newer version of Z. So here are the two snippets. The first one, actually you can see the first connection that is for the 5.0.2 and older, where you can see that the connection is actually reported as outbound with the, with the history, with history starting with an H, the capital H. And then the second one, when I tested, Z actually flipped the connection, which is good because this is what was happening. So Z, Z, Z didn't see the SYN packet and it should have flipped the connection. So in the second one, you can actually see that it is an inbound inbound connection, and just because this just because the source port the person or the source IP was using was IRC, it was actually getting detected as IRC as a as an analyzer. So act, connection was getting flipped, but not completely flipped. Like the 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 right protocol analy analyzer was still not getting triggered. So uh, and again, I saw the weird reports, and all the same weird got triggered again. So that was the. Um, the PR that we tested. And then finally, we did some more troubleshooting and we ran, uh, we ran that PCAP in bare mode and we enabled and disabled a couple of analyzers and we, we came to a conclusion that there is a kind of like teeny tiny bug that actually when the connections are flipped by Zeke, intuitively, the right analyzer is still not hooked with the connection and the old analyzer will still come into play. So that's why that was still detected as IRC even in 5.1 version. So we have submitted that bug report and I just wanted to uh, give a big shout out to Justin because he was amazing in trying to troubleshoot the issue with me. And I learned so many new things that if, this, if that happens, these are the steps you should take to uh, analyze or troubleshoot the connection. So that was the uh, IRC connection conclusion. So in summary, I just, oh, I'm doing good on, I'm doing good on time. So in summary, um, we are still analyzing the outbound traffic connections based on our known services outbound.log file. And um, we are actually in the process of analyzing some of our network misconfiguration where we are actually, uh, Zeke is reporting all those connections outbound, but they are actually inbound connections. It's just like for some reason, Zeke is missing the same packets of those connections. So we still are trying to figure out where exactly uh, the pain point is of the network or we are just want we are trying to pinpoint where exactly the problem lies. Still, it's in progress. We haven't figured it out yet. Uh, so that's why we're still in investigating that. And then again, like it gave us, a, just enabling those scripts gave us a decent idea of what, uh, what internet services our clients reach out to. And it gave us a basic good picture of these are the 15 services you are actually seeing your servers re reaching out to. So that was nice to know. And then the last part, when I was analy analyzing different other services, they were pretty leg legit connections. So it was nice to verify that our systems are not going outbound and connecting uh, on SSH over any random IP address or any random server. They were actually connecting to a list of uh, internet servers that they were expected to connect to. Same with SMTP and some other protocols that we analyzed. So it was nice to verify that we are not seeing anything funny on our network in terms of the outbound traffic. So that was the summary of that investigation. And then the last slide is where to find the script. So the, both the scripts that I talked about, the custom one that we added the origin flag to, that and the outbound services, they both are available uh, via ZKG install. So if you guys are interested, you can pull them down, uh, pull both of the packages down and enable them. One tiny note here is um, the first one, you can run that independently because it is just adding one add one extra flag and one extra column in the log file. 
The second one, however, is dependent on the first one because we are not initiating the broker store again in the second one. So if you are just running the outbound services by itself, it might show you, it might give you an error saying that there is no broker store available because we just initiate the broker store for the known services once in the first script, and then we are just reusing that and adding more and more uh, server IPs to it. So they go hand in hand. Again, first script, you can just enable like that, and you will have extra nice column in your known services.log file. But the second one for the outbound, just make sure that the first one is enabled because it is dependent on that one. So other than that, there are, if you just want to look at the scripts, they are in the GitHub account as well. And um, with that, I am pretty much done with my presentation. Hopefully, once we go through the analysis of our egress traffic, we might have more results or interesting use cases to share with you guys by next year, and then we will see how that project goes. So that was pretty much it. Thanks, Fatima. I, I can take questions. We got a few minutes for questions. Question. I just wanted to say, Fatima, your ticket is phenomenal. I wish they were all like that. So basically, the last five slides of that talk are in the ticket. It was as easy as possible you know, for us to troubleshoot. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you. Other questions? Actually, Fatima, at the end, you, you said when you were working with Justin, you learned how to next time track down these things. Yes. Mind, mind saying a bit about that? How, huh? Mind saying a bit about that? How, how would you do it next time? So, uh, well, I, I, it's been a long time. I have troubleshooted anything with Zeek. So first time I saw the connection, I was like, I don't know where to go. I know something is wrong. I know it should not be detected as IRC. It should be detected as HTTP. But I didn't know where to actually verify that. So when I contacted him, he was like, from the step one, why don't you run it in bare mode? Why don't you run it with this analyzer? Why don't you? And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then we ran it with the uh, miscellaneous dump events as well. So it was really nice to see that when we ran it with miscellaneous dump, uh, dump miscellaneous, miscellaneous slash dump events, you can see all the different um, analyzers triggering and the, and the final analyzer, analyzer confirmation of the protocol. So though I forgot about those steps. I was like, I would have never done that if Justin, had, Justin wouldn't have said that. So I, I usually take a note of whenever I troubleshoot something that, OK, these are the steps I did before. So hopefully in the next time, if we have similar issues. And I mentioned we are having similar issues where, and I think I, I spoke Justin, Justin about that as well. We were seeing a UDP connection from um, an open VPN port. No, actually, an LDAP port to our open VPN port. It looked like scanning, but unfortunately, it's UDP. So even, even when the Zeek missed the first packet, it, is, it flipped it as an outbound uh, LDAP connection. And it was triggering that you have, you have servers reaching out outbound to LDAP servers. It was actually not that case. It was like the source IP was using LDAP port, and it was scanning our open VPN servers. So it was reported as, as if our open VPN servers are, are reaching out to outbound LDAP port. So I just followed the same drill. And there is not, not much we can do for UDP, again, because first packet is missed, it's missed. So I was just contacting him uh, again for that. But I knew the, the basic drill that, OK, this is what I need to do next time. So so yeah, you can, you can uh, so I think in general way of seeing that, uh, you can run Zeek in read mode. And then if you, know, uh, if you know there is a bare mode available where Zeek doesn't load any kind of protocol analyzers by default. So if you, start anal if you see that there is a wrong protocol analyzer attached to a connection that you think that it shouldn't have, then you should just start running in bare mode and start adding different analyzers and see where exactly that flip happens. That, OK, it was first detected, detected as HTTP, but now it is all of a sudden detected as IR, IRC connection. So I don't know if that was Perfect. useful. <laughs> Thanks. Last chance? There. Um, this might be a slightly naive question, but is, is the goal here to identify like persistent server endpoints or to build like server client associations or uh, you know to tag specific flows with a protocol or, or, or something else? So the goal here was to just get familiarized with how much uh, internet services we are using as clients. Because if we want to, if we plan to implement something in future for blocking egress traffic, we should know that if there are any specific services, we just have to blanket allow. Like for example, HTTP, we cannot even tag um, 
client and server because server IPs can keep changing because it's web server, right? Somebody is to, uh, running it on one server and all of a sudden the IP changes the next time. So we cannot like tie it with the client server, but with, but just by knowing that, okay, HTTP and SSL are the services that really you cannot do much about, but just allowing it from your uh, allowing them from your outbound traffic would help a lot because then other other services that we are pretty pretty restrictive about we can actually try to start to block them right like for example if you have a dns policy where you do not want to allow your clients to go outbound and just try to connect to random dns servers you can actually block dns outbound but you have to allow your other dns servers like the recursive servers and the authority servers to even reach out to other dns servers so just by knowing that is very helpful in uh, in assessing that how many exception rules you would need in future to just block the egress traffic. So yeah, it was, th this is very beginning. Like we are just trying to understand our network and we are just trying to understand uh, how many systems and servers would require that kind of exception. But as, as I said, that 15 service in that list, I was expecting more than that. So it is kind of like pretty decent right now, decent looking right now so far. So that's the first goal that just to know what, what outbound connections you have in your network. So we'll go from there. Yeah, I think I may have sort of branched in the wrong direction because of the name known services. Because again, in your presentation, it does seem very client focused. And um, you know, Ashish has been telling me to use, use this stuff for a long time. And I thought it was sort of a replacement, you know, a passive way of doing like, like what you would do actively with NMAP mapping. That's that's pretty much it. So I have been a very big fan of known services, anyways. All like always because it just gives you. You don't have to scan for it on your network. You know, like if you just want to know if you have DNS servers, just look at the passive uh, log file, which is known services. If it's a legit DNS server, there there has to be a connection in last seven days that 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 DNS server had responded to. If it's a legit server, so if 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 the services are running as they're supposed to on your network then passive scanning is great. Like you can just go and say, okay, these are the 15 web servers I have. So just to know your network, the known logs are very important, I think, in the, in the Zeek uh, log files. Just to do like a passive scan or the first pass of just knowing your network. Great, thanks Fatima. Of course.